Please don't try this at home. This is extremely dangerous. Photo flash capacitors, 330 volt, 150 microfarad. I've tested a lot of these and they're in pretty good shape, considering they're from a surplus store. Laser cut, cardboard, sort of space frame, structural elements to hold everything together. I have eight of these. Uh, should bring us up to about a kilojoule. This capacitor bank will let me store a bunch of energy over a long time and then release it all really quickly in a fraction of a second. I really dialed in the, the press fit on the laser cutter and it's totally worth it. Pop it in and it just stays. This is 12 gauge solid copper wire. A thousand joules is equivalent to running a phone charger for about a minute or a hair dryer for about one second. It's also roughly the energy in the gunpowder inside a nine millimeter bullet. These all release about the same amount of energy, but on very different time scales. The capacitor bank should release its thousand joules even faster than the bullet does making it useful for some physics demonstrations and also some really fun sparks. Here I'm sort of weaving the capacitor leads in a zipper pattern around the copper wire and then using the wire to push them down. The capacitor leads are now spring-loaded onto the copper wire forming a good electrical contact. I'm soldering these wires together but this solder is only about 10% the conductivity of copper, so it's always good to have the wires in physical contact so the solder doesn't have to carry the current very far. How are we doing? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Have a good Christmas? Yeah, we did, how are you? Also, you generally don't want to use solder as a mechanical connector. Uh, you want to attach the wires securely before soldering and then just use the solder for electrical connection. And that's because solder is pretty weak and brittle and even minor stress from wires shaking will fatigue and break the joint in um, some amount of time. But these joints aren't going to get vibrated or stressed much, so it's fine here. Unfortunately, these aren't ready to use yet. Uh, these capacitors are old and need to be reformed. So inside of an aluminum electrolytic capacitor, you've got two sheets of aluminum foil uh, with an electrolytic sort of solution um, liquid between the two. And say this is the negative pole and this is the positive pole of your capacitor. The positive pole has a layer of aluminum oxide grown on it. So this oxide is a really good insulator and that's all a capacitor is, is, is two conductors with an insulator between them. They, they use alkaline electrolytes and I know a, a one they used to use in the old days was borax, uh, which, is, which is a very reducing um, chemical and, and will attack oxides and given enough time and start to degrade and erode and create little pock marks. If we just tried to apply the rated voltage to this capacitor, what would probably happen is the, the thin little bits of oxide here would break down, current would flow through this thing, you'd have a huge hot spot, you'd boil the electrolyte and the whole capacitor would explode. Um, with reforming, we're trying to charge the capacitor up very, very, very slowly. So force this, this reforming current through to kind of pull oxygens out of the, the alkaline solution and redeposit and re, regrow this insulating layer. But, um, but going slow enough so that heat doesn't build up and it doesn't, we, we don't wreck the thing. Got all the capacitors connected in parallel with individual 
load resistors on each one of the anodes, 150 ohms a piece, so that any of the banks short, the others won't explode it. Adjustable voltage power supply right here. Um, that's going to charge the whole bank through a 2.5k resistor. Okay, so I've set this shot up with a clock. Um, the current reading is in milliamps, so 950 microlamps right now. Uh, bear in mind, this is almost 20 millifarads, um, and the charger time constant is somewhere around 48 seconds. So... The current tapers down very, very slowly um, over the course of minutes. So let's watch it. I did some math, and it looks like uh, with the 48 second time constant, if the capacitors are not leaky at all, like ideally, um, after five minutes of charging, there should be about 40 microamps of charge current left. So anything in excess of that is indication that we are reforming, like chemically reconstructing that aluminum oxide layer. Okay, I want to go to sleep, but uh, these are still charged up. I got about 400 joules in them. Uh, I'm going to try to discharge them with this light bulb. This is a halogen um, 43 watt. This feels really stupid. I'm wearing safety glasses off camera. And the glove I'm wearing is not so much to protect me from an electrical shock, it's more to protect me from potential flying broken glass uh, in case the light bulb explodes. Holy hell, it's way brighter than normal. Okay, so I hooked up a, like a high value, like super slow bleeder resistor to kind of draw the voltage down overnight. Took another look this morning and to my surprise discovered that not all of these um, capacitor modules are fully discharged. So it looks like, let me check the voltage on them one by one. This one's discharged, that's good. This one has 20 volts on it, 18. This one's got 50, is that? That one's got, that's basically nothing. This one's at 86, is not safe to touch. 63. This one's zero, and this one's zero. And then the, the bus, after all the resistors, so what I was treating as the, as the general anode of the charging system, is at zero. So it looks like that puff of smoke I got last night was some of these resistors open circuiting in, in response to the demand. So these uh, little resistors are not overload rated. That's good to know. Not even for a second or two. So I figured I'd a uh, little demo of me discharging these one by one with a screwdriver at um, a tiny percentage of their nominal capacity. So 18 volts I think is, is well under a joule. Um, 
Let's see what this looks like. All right, not so bad. Fifty volts is, I think, somewhere around five joules. Also, not so bad. I'm using tool steel, so it tends to throw off a lot of little little sparklers. That one's dead, but yeah, absolutely no spark under a volt. Okay, this is the one at 86. That's, um, I think, 8-ish joules. Let's see what that does. Oh, yeah. This is a good one. Yeah, so that's what 8 joules sounds like. This, uh, this whole bank can do about a thousand. So yeah, looking forward to that. Here's an illustration of why my resistors burned out the other night. This is a transient thermal response curve for these resistors. The kind I used are a CF14 size, so we're looking at the blue line here. These resistors are rated to a quarter watt average. Um, you can use a duty cycle and have the resistor burn one watt for 25% of the time, and it'll be okay, provided you follow this graph. The thing to take away here is if you burn one watt for one minute and then turn it off for three minutes, that's technically a quarter watt average over four minutes. But it'll burn up a few seconds into the first minute because one minute is way too long to sustain an overload like that. This graph tells me that what I did that night, burning about two watts in each resistor for about two seconds, was way too hard for the resistors to handle. I should have consulted this graph before trying to use that light bulb. Here's my revised reforming setup. Uh, each module is going to get its own 300K half watt resistor uh, connected through an LED so I can watch uh, the leakage current kind of visually per module with a little backwards connected diode so that uh, I can still discharge. And we're back. Uh, I only hooked up four of these little glowing charge indicator bleeder resistor things because uh, I didn't want to spend a ton of components and time on just a couple hours of passive work. So I'll do four of these at a time. Same setup as before, currents and milliamps. We're at 0.85 milliamps right now. Soaking at 100 volts, we'll take it up to 330. Okay, it's been two days, but the reforming is done. My adjustable 400 volt power supply died with a puff of smoke in the middle, so I just charged these in two stages, first with 160 volts rectified wall power, and then with wall power through a simple charge pump voltage doubler, uh, up to about 320 volts. Um, some modules are better than others, like some ended up with lower leakage current than others, um, but each module was uh, under about 100 microamps, so that, that should be good enough. Now it's time to put the modules back together and do a pack. I organized this build into eight different modules so that I can reconfigure it for either a high voltage low capacitance or a low voltage high capacitance fairly easily. The first thing I want to do with this wants high voltage, so I'm going to put these all in series right now. There are a lot of ways to physically arrange these. They're shaped sort of weird with the, the cathode wrapped around and the anode emerging from one side. The main goal in this stage is to minimize parasitics, which is just what we call unintended components that exist, like the resistance of the wire. The wire has some small resistance that I want to minimize, because the lower res the resistance of the whole pack, the faster my power pulses can be. I also want to minimize inductance, because that can slow down my pulses too. One of the strategies used in pulse capacitors is to use a fairly high voltage so that parasitic resistance and inductance won't slow you down as much. That's just Ohm's law and the inductor equation. If your V is really high, even mediocre resistance will let lots of current flow. 
Same with inductance. Uh, high voltage maximizes your di dt, or the rate of change of the current. Because voltage is on my side here with 2600 volts with them all in series, um, it's not that crucial. But look at this. I can stack them sideways, all facing the same direction, and connect the anode from this one to the cathode from this one and then do the, do the same thing up here with the next one. But look at this long wire path from here all the way around and then around again. That long wire path has a pretty significant resistance and long meandering paths have significant inductance. So that's, that's no good. But if I just flip this one around and then connect this anode to the middle of this, this cathode kind of horseshoe, then all of the current going out of this anode and into these cathodes gets split in two. So I've, I've basically doubled the wire that I get to use for free, and I've also cut the inductance down quite a bit because putting inductors in parallel reduces their value. So I think I'm going to go with this arrangement and just alternate left, right, left, right. There are ways to arrange these even more efficiently. Um, you know, with, with using different, you know, sticking all the leads towards each other and then building a weird box to hold everything together like this. But I, I don't want to bother with, with stuff this complex and finicky, so. I don't want to hear anybody make fun of me for two-dimensional thinking. Fuck it, I'm doing cardboard and hot glue. The trigger on this glue gun broke, so I just need to push the glue in from the back. project has taken so long. I am so ready to be done. I used a function generator and a scope to characterize the cat bank's impedance over a wide frequency range to measure its parasitics. What I found was really great. The parasitics are a lot lower than I feared. I might do a video on this whole thing, but really quickly, what I did was put an AC voltage across it with a function generator, and then use a scope to measure the current through it with a series shunt resistor. Since I was using a scope, I was also able to look at the phase lag between voltage and current. Here I've plotted my measured impedances and phases across a range of frequencies. At low frequencies, the impedance decreases with increasing frequency because capacitors pass AC. The exact slope of that line indicates about 305 microfarads. At some point though, the frequency gets high enough for the parasitic inductance to start blocking the AC, and the impedance rises again. 
That inductance is about 900 nanohenries, which is the inductance of a single loop of wire roughly the size of that capacitor bank. I count that as a huge win. It could have been much worse because those capacitors are wound up like jelly rolls. It could have been very inductive. Right in the middle where the two lines cross and the phase lag is zero, a magical thing happens called resonance. At this point, the inductor and capacitor effectively cancel each other out, and all we're measuring is the DC resistance of the wires. That's about 80 milliohms, which is really good too. Now that I've characterized it, I can model it in SPICE and then simulate what'll happen if I discharge it into a variety of different loads. These are surplus little multi-LED display assemblies. Here I'm making bleeder resistors for the pack so that it doesn't maintain a dangerous charge for more than, say, an hour. I'm also including an LED so there's a visual indication of danger. I'm putting backwards diodes in to protect the LEDs from reverse voltage. Uh, during an inductive discharge, the pack voltage can go negative very briefly, and LEDs are really sensitive to reverse voltage. I've sized the 470K resistor to burn just under a quarter watt at 330 volts. And here I'm making a divide by a thousand uh, voltage probe lead for my multimeter, turning it into a KV meter. Here I'm sort of improvising a switch. This is garbage, but it'll work for now. Okay, live fire test. We're shooting for 200 joules this time. It's around 1150 volts.
I love that it jiggles when you take that thing off. That, like... Yeah. Like, it could touch, maybe. <laughs> it's a It's a pretty strong piece of copper right there. All right, watch. What am I watching? Where? Like, yes. It's not important. Oh! <laughs> it came at me. <laughs> that was.
500 joules. Smooth elsewhere. Thought I was going to hammer this video out in a few days, but uh, it's been two weeks of work, uh, so I hope you like it. I have big plans for this thing. Um, expect to see a lot of plasma on this channel soon. If you want to see me explode something in particular, leave your suggestions in the comments. Thanks for watching.